This is Andy Alsbaugh from Duke University School of Medicine. In this presentation, we are going to focus on the treatment and preventive strategies for systemic infections due to various candida species. We will also explore the growing knowledge about candida pathogenesis and patient risk factors for this infection to imagine better treatment options than we have currently today. The first question I would like to pose is why it's important to treat these infections. How serious is the disease, especially candida bloodstream infections? Several investigators have tried to define what is called the attributable mortality for candidemia. How much death is specifically due to this infection? For example, if we have identical patients in the intensive care unit and one group develops catheter-related candidemia and the other group does not, how much more mortality do we see in the candidemic group? Now, several studies over many decades have suggested that candida bloodstream infections have an attributable mortality or excess death rate of about 38 to 49 percent. This is a striking number, underscoring how sick these patients truly are. Therefore, we're compelled to begin therapy rapidly and definitively when we recognize systemic candidiasis. Many of the major antifungal agents have potent activity against candida species. One of the oldest but still used antifungal agents is amphotericin B. Active against cell membrane ergosterol, this agent has broad activity against most candida species. However, it has significant toxicities such as inducing renal insufficiency and it must be used with caution. The, the echinocandins are a new class of antifungals and they inhibit cell wall beta-glucan formation. Some individual drug names include mycofungin and caspofungin. They are widely used today for the initial treatment of candidemia for several reasons. First, they are fungicidal as opposed to fungistatic, killing the yeast and hyphal cells rather than merely inhibiting their growth. Also, they are active against most candida species. Now, this is helpful while you, you are awaiting the formal identification of the specific isolate in an infection, as well as its specific drug susceptibilities. The current echinocandins are only available in IV preparations, and they have little activity in ur urinary tract infections, as well as unproven penetration into the central nervous system. Also, there is some resistance to uh, echinocandins that's developing among candida species, and this phenomenon will need careful attention in the, in the coming years. Now, the azoles are likely the most frequently prescribed antifungal agents for uh, syst systemic candidiasis. Inhibiting the production of ergosterol, they are well tolerated by most patients, although their activity is considered to be fungistatic and not cidal. Fluconazole is the prototype of a yeast active azole, having little activity against molds or dimorphic fungi. However, this drug has potent activity against many candida species. Now, these agents can either be given intravenously in very sick patients or orally. You must remember that drug-drug interactions must be carefully and actively monitored since the azoles are potent inhibitors of cytochrome P450. Now, why do I mention the importance here of drug resistance when we consider using azoles to treat systemic and serious candida infections? The most important concept that I want you to remember about the treatment of systemic candida infections is that the ultimate choice of therapy should be based on formal identification of the actual candida species involved, and ideally accompanied by antifungal susceptibility testing. Now on the right panel of this slide, I'm demonstrating one method of determining whether a particular drug has activity against a given candida isolate. These culture plates have been inoculated with a single candida strain and a drug impregnated disc placed on the plate. As the fungus grows, the drug diffuses from the disc into the growth medium. In the top panel, the drug is inhibiting the growth of this isolate and therefore likely has at least some activity against the strain. Now the wider the diameter of the zone of inhibition, the more activity the drug might have. In contrast, the lower panel demonstrates a drug-bug combination in which there is no appreciable inhibitor activity. This drug would therefore not be predicted to be active against this strain. Now, we'll use this type of data to tailor our antifungal therapy 
for our own patient's infection. We can also begin to predict antifungal susceptibility patterns based on the candida species. Now, up to this point, I have not really focused on the different species names of candida, but speciation becomes essential when we consider treatment. Candida albicans, the most common cause of systemic candidiasis, is commonly susceptible to fluconazole and other azoles, as well as Econocandins and Amphotericin B. We often only see resistance develop in candida albicans in patients who require chronic antifungal therapy, such as AIDS patients with refractory mucosal candidiasis, or potentially in patients with chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. Now, two other candida species listed here, candida parapsilosis and candida tropicalis, are also usually susceptible to fluconazole and the other antifungals, but they are typically only observed to cause infections in hospitalized patients. More frequent azole resistance is observed in two other species that are also most commonly encountered in hospitalized patients, candida glabrata and candida cruzii. Now, Candida cruzii is intrinsically resistant to most azoles, and alternative antifungals such as the IV echinocandins and amphotericin B are often required to treat infections due to this particular species. Candida glabrata, on the other hand, displays what is termed as dose-dependent azole susceptibility. Now, many isolates can be treated by high-dose fluconazole, while others are more resistant. Again, specific testing and individual isolates will help guide your ultimate therapy. In addition to antifungal medications, I want to re reinforce two additional concepts. In most cases, isolation of candida from the bloodstream must be taken seriously, due, again, to what we have decided is the high risk of complications and death from this infection. This is not akin to isolating coagulase-negative staphylococcus from a single blood culture, uh, perhaps indicating a contamination of the culture. Also, you must consider the source of the candida infection, potentially addressing infected catheters or other foreign material, and also addressing reversible issues of immunosuppression when possible. There is extensive guidance about the treatment of these infections in practice guidelines that have been published by the Infectious Diseases Society of America, and the reference is listed here. Lastly, what types of measures can we take to prevent systemic candidiasis? First, much attention has been appropriately focused on adherence to rigorous aseptic techniques when inserting IV catheters to prevent any number of catheter-associated infections from staph infections to candida infections. Now, antifungal agents can also be used as prophylactic or preventive agents in patients at high risk for developing candidemia. Now, these drugs have been rigorously tested in patients receiving cancer chemotherapy or stem cell transplantations, especially those with active neutropenia or with graft versus host disease. Now, although the studies are not quite as conclusive, Antifungal agents have also been used when the gut is compromised, potentially resulting in contamination by microbes in the GI tract, such as after a GI perforation due to appendicitis or diverticulitis, or after a complicated GI surgery. There are exciting and emerging themes in treating systemic candida infections uh, that are being driven by basic investigation in candida pathogenesis. For instance, Answering these questions, how might the microbiota be protected or manipulated to prevent excessive candida colonization? How might we disrupt candida biofilms given our knowledge about their formation and structure? Lastly, some investigators have explored using surface or secreted factors from candida species as the basis for novel vaccine strategies to prevent candidiasis in high-risk patients. Now, these are very exciting possibilities as we envision new ways to prevent these serious and life-threatening infections in our patients.